three, two, one. What is going on, Jay? What's going oh, on? Oh, just living the dream here in South Florida. How are you, Aaron? I'm good, man. Thanks. Um, just thank you. One of wanted to thank you for being on the podcast. Um, we just want to welcome you if you're listening to us on your device or streaming or wherever. Um, my name is Aaron, and you are on the God is Awesome podcast. I'll be your host today. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do here is we just interview regular everyday Christians about their testimony. And the testimony is basically what God has done in their life. Um, I like referring to the story that you know Moses had to take off his shoes when he was walking on holy ground. Um, and this is kind of like holy ground, right? Like I see this mm -hmm. like going into someone's past and their story with how God has changed and shaped their lives and what struggles they've been pulled out of all on all that. And it's like this reflection that we get to share with other people. And it's like, holy ground, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of ups and downs with all this. Yeah. And so um, we, we're just really welcoming. So if you, if you find this like beneficial for yourself or for someone else, please share it. Please like it. Please share it to the group um, because, uh, you know, like we're not trying to like be famous here, but we're trying to help and, and build the community up um, to, to where this church supports itself and lifts each other up and celebrates and praises when we praise and cries when other people cry, you know what I mean? Anyway, um, we're going to kick it over to you, Jay, uh, about what your story is. Maybe start off with your background, like okay. your origin story, shaping yeah, forth yeah, yeah. when you're growing up. So uh, off you go. Well, I was born as an alien on another planet. No, just kidding. <laughs> Um, actually, I am, uh, so currently I'm 41 years old. I am a husband to Emily, a dad to, to four children, Brooklyn, Elijah, Micah, and Hannah. Four um, children. Four children, that's right. right. Yeah. Um, I think it was Jim Gaffigan who said one time, uh, people were asking him what it's like to have four kids. And he says, okay, imagine you're drowning, and then somebody hands you a baby, and that's it. And that's a <laughs> pretty, pretty accurate. Yeah, I think like with three kids, I think maybe we... Um, thought for like half a day that we had it together. And then we're like, Hey, we should foster now. Um, <laughs> so fostering led into adoption. So anyway, yeah, I am three biological, one adopted child. I'm from West Virginia. I grew up just outside of Huntington, West Virginia, which is where Marshall university is. So big herd fan, um, which also like I give myself the freedom to root for any team that's going to win because being a Marshall fan, um, I don't know. You go through decades of, of dry spells. <laughs> you just need some kind of win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, my mom and dad, uh, I think it, when you talk about the story of Jesus in, in, in you, and especially mine, where uh, in my adult life, there's been a lot of uh, really hard things, a lot of really legitimate suffering. Um, it wasn't that my, my childhood lacked suffering, but the core foundational piece of my childhood, I think there's a couple of them. One was um, I think the most important was just a very, very solid relationship with my mom and dad um, mm -hmm. who really loved each other and really loved me. So no matter what happened in my life, I, I just never doubted the love of, mm -hmm. of my mom and dad. And I had some older siblings and I was far enough away from them. This is really interesting, Aaron. Um, far, like I was seven years from the next closest one. So I was a child when I was watching some of my siblings wrestle through the teenage rebellion. Sure. And so I got to see that like dad standing up hard and tough and then them leave the house and like dad breaking down crying because of a broken heart for what his kids were going through. And so that really always stuck with me. Um, and, and, and really I think informed my understanding of God as father. And I think that's just one of the most important, important principles for mom and dads to get is, is how foundational your view, like if you have a child, their primary way that they're going to interpret God as father is what they experience in the home. And so oh, yeah. for me, I was just really blessed with that mm -hmm. um, and really blessed with a, a great church. Um, was it Fellowship Baptist Church in Barbersville, West Virginia for my, my whole life um, from you know, childhood through graduating, going into college, and then actually ended up back in ministry. And that was my first uh, working environment was was back at that church. And, um, you know, it wasn't like everything was great all the time. Uh, we went through a couple miniature splits and stuff like that. But my experience was always genuine people that really loved Jesus, really loved us. And even if I didn't agree with everything that that they always said or taught, 
there was a genuineness about them. Um, and so um, as a child, it was the most natural thing in the world for me to want to be with Jesus. You know, well, of, of course I want to be with Jesus. Like he, yeah. and I knew I was a sinner. Um, it was really clear. Like you learn a lot of good um, sin tactics from older brothers and sisters sometimes. So <laughs> I got good early at some of that stuff, but I knew it was wrong and I knew it was yeah. sinful. And it's like, well, why wouldn't I want to be with God? Why wouldn't I want to be with Jesus? So I remember, yeah. um, as a child being up in my room and actually praying and asking God to help me to know for sure that I was going to be in heaven and um, not go to hell for my sins. And I just remember, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I was overwhelmed with this, this feeling of peace of Mm -hmm. knowing that I don't have to pray this anymore, um, that it's true. And I remember running downstairs and jumping in the lap of either my mom or dad, they were both sitting down there and telling them, Hey, I know that I'm not going to hell because Jesus saved me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, my faith experience was was communal and very personal. Um, and so growing up, you know, different levels of passion and stuff like that for, you know, I was really excited for Jesus at times and then really, really wanted to fit in um, at gotcha. other times. And I think I think middle and high school was kind of one of those like real waffling of, you know, if you think of like your brain and they describe guys as like your brain is a waffle right. sometimes. Um right really true for me. Yes. Like compartmentalizing my faith, Mm -hmm. which I always had, but then there was my faith and then what I wanted to do. Um, And so kind of like walking really a a life of, of compromise that didn't seem bad. Cause as long as I surrounded myself with people who were doing worse than me, um, I was fine. Um, So let me ask you something. So when did you pray that prayer of like, I want to know. I was like six years old. Six years yeah, old. Yeah, six years old. Wow. I always say February 16th, 1984. Oh, you got the date. It's a completely arbitrary date that I made oh, up you a made few it years up. later. Because like, <laughs> I needed a spiritual birthday. So it was around that time. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I, so, I don't yeah, know. it just seems like that's something like kids struggle with. If they're coming to faith, right, in a, in a good environment, right? Mm-hmm. Like not some crazy cocained out environment. Yeah. Parents loved each other. Parents loved you. Good church. There's this like internal struggle of like, how do I know that I'm saved? Right. And you said that it was just a piece. It wasn't really like an audible answer. It was just a feeling of peace or a security of peace. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, Aaron, as I got older, you know, because as children, we believe our parents. And Mm -hmm. then if, if their life looks credible, as we get older, we continue to believe them unless we're presented with some completely alternative reality. You know, like if we find out they're complete flaming hypocrites, then, then that might wreck our faith and things like that. But the the people who presented Jesus to me continued to be trustworthy in the major things in life. And so mm-hmm. um, I think that made it easy to go deep with my roots in faith early. Yeah, credible. Um, These are credible yeah, people. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'll say that as, as I was in my teenage years, uh, oddly enough, like there were times where I doubted the existence of God, mm-hmm. but it was one of those like, okay, I, I'm kind of doubting whether God exists right now, but if he does, I know I belong to him. So mm-hmm. it was it was one of these like kind of extremes of like, maybe he doesn't exist at all, yeah. but if he does, I'm definitely his. Um, gotcha. So, and so I was never one of those that, like, I actually, I think as a child before six years old, probably raised my hand two or three times and, and different sure. things. But, Just a double sure that you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but my salvation experience was always very personal. Like I always remember that moment in that room. And, and, and from then on, like I, even when I was really stupid in my walk, um, really stupid in my faith, it, I just knew that I belonged to Jesus and just needed to get back relationally. And I think some of that is again, what you experience in your home. And I had experienced um, rebellious siblings in my home, but they always were part of the family. Like, the relationship is broken, but they were never disowned. And so that was really helpful for me as I then began my, my version of rebellion of just yeah. really doing what I wanted. It, and it was never like, I hate God. I want to go against God. It's just, I really like my stuff. And I really right. like my This is when you bust stuff. out you yeah. you bust that your uh, faith. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was, I mean, I would say like my middle and high school all of that was was kind of this dichotomy of like the good church kid who still did most of the stuff that his friends did, just not to the extremes that they mm-hmm. did. Um, 
And that really, I would say the radical change in that, a, a couple of things happened. One was um, kind of started down poor relationship paths. And then my, my senior year of high school, my school consolidated with another school. And I was dating a girl, I had no business dating at the time. Um, and then I get into the first, first day of class and this girl um, sits in front of me who I didn't know, who was really pretty and immediately starts talking to me about her summer mission trip to Jamaica and the church camp that she was at and how oh. she wanted to be a missionary. And I'm like, whoa, well, I've never met a pretty girl that loved Jesus before. I don't know what to do with this. They're, they're all loved true. you before. Like, it's, it's, it's not, <laughs> it's, that's mean and not true because I did have them, but like, oh. I've never, I, okay. I've never met a pretty girl who loves Jesus, who is showing me the time of day. Maybe that was the, the oh, third okay. one in there. Cause like oh, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm covering my ears here with this, but like, you know, take off some of the body fat that comes with 25 years of age. Like they yeah. really stuck out. So like I, you know, I was a nerd with big ears. So funny. anyway, like being in a bad relationship and yet having this example of somebody who passionately loved Jesus, who was pretty and who would talk to me, it kind of wrecked me for a while. Um, <laughs> but it began, yeah, it began the process of, of really changing who I was. And so, you know, ended that one relationship, started dating that girl. Um, and ultimately, you know, kind of jumping ahead in that story, I ended up marrying her um, oh, five years later, right after graduation from college, wow. ended up marrying her. Um, but the other major piece, I think, in the like explosion of my faith was um, I, I had been trying to get into the Air Force Academy since I was like in ninth grade and I really worked hard to do that. Got accepted, got in. And all of a sudden, like I'm in basic training in Colorado with eight weeks and one phone call to, to anybody that I love and care about, um, stripped of everything. And the only thing that I had was like, actually when we got off the bus to start basic training, the, the Gideons were standing there at the door and handed you these little right. military Gideon Bibles. Yeah. And, um, and so I put that like in my, um, BDUs, my like fatigues, battle dress uniform. And, um, whenever like, I felt lonely. Like I couldn't talk to my parents. I couldn't talk to my girlfriend, none of that. I really started leaning into the Lord and like, I would, open, I would go to the bathroom because it's like the only place that we were allowed to not stand at attention. And so like, you know, you go to the bathroom and you'd sit on the toilet and then I would open this up and like, just start reading the Bible. Mm. And so for that, like eight, nine week period of basic training, I really like the Bible became my refuge and my relationship with Jesus became my refuge in a way that it had never been. Mm -hmm. And and so when I got into that first school year, it was the first time that I decided to start reading the Bible every day. Now I'd been a Christian for like 12 years by this point, yeah. but this was the first time that I took the ownership of reading God's word and for, for got into a really solid Bible study, a, a college Bible study, got connected with a local church there and that community helped begin to shape me. And so really like I exploded in growth yeah. When I finally really took personal ownership of my faith. You know, that's the only time, like, I can't think of a better way. If someone wants to take ownership of their faith, just read the, just read the darn thing. Read the yeah. Bible. Yeah. And because you could, you could be like fed, right? Sermons yeah. and all this stuff and, and be around community. Like, those are all fantastic. That's why we do it. It's like, but those are like number two and three. Right. Like, you got to get like one-on-one -on -one time with the man in the yeah. Bible. It's just like, that's the number one way to explode your faith. It's just Absolutely. And and I remember reaching out to my youth pastor once I was out of basic training. And, and like, it was actually the first time I ever had a computer and the first time I had ever emailed in my life. Like, this was 1995. Um, so so uh, I remember emailing and saying, hey, I've decided to read the Bible. Yeah, this is how you do it with like, <laughs> your lobster claws. Um but this is how I've, like, I've decided to actually start reading the Bible. And, and um, he suggested something that he'd probably suggested 25 times that I never listened to when I was in youth. And he said, hey, there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs and there's 31 days in the longest month. So a really good way to start is read one chapter of Proverbs a day. So whatever day of the month it is, read that chapter. And if you miss a day, just pick up in the next, you know, whatever the date is. And so I actually did that for the first two or three months. And then I began to add Psalms to it and then kind of grew from there. But there's just so much godly practical wisdom in Proverbs um, that it was just for me a great place to start. And it's one that I've recommended to a lot of people since then. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we, we're, we're going through your um, story here, kind of yeah. out of adolescence. Uh -huh. um, and tell me about your marriage. Okay. 
So I end up marrying, uh, her name was Christy Mills, and uh, she was my high school sweetheart. We dated for all but like four months of, of five years. I um, only had one breakup ever, and it was pretty devastating, but I managed to live. Oh, uh, we got back together, got married 13 days after graduation um, oh. from, from college. Okay. And I had already started as a youth pastor at Fellowship Baptist Church in Barbersville, West Virginia. And um, we we were there five to seven years, something like that. Now, when I was in college, um, I, I ended up, by the way, I ended up transferring from Air Force Academy to Liberty after my faith grew so much. I, I knew I wanted to go into ministry. So um, I left after a couple years and began studying the Bible. Um, Chrissy and I had a heart for missions, but we also felt like we were completely ignorant too. And so the thought was, let's go work in a local church so that we can learn how church works sure. before going overseas and planting some horrendous smart. dumpster fire of a church. Yeah, um, yeah seems smart. Um, so we get involved and we're doing the youth and uh, just begin to like experiment with these kids on uh, how far can you push kids without them realizing that you're asking them to do absurd things. And, and it really worked. So like, oh, so we, yeah, we took, we took, uh, you know, like kids to inner city Baltimore when like three weeks after we got married, um, we took, we took kids to like the ghetto in inner city Baltimore. And then the next year we went to Trinidad and Tobago, which I'm a parent of a 16 year old now. And there's not a 22 year old man on earth that I would let take my 16 year old daughter to sure. Trinidad and Tobago. But, um, but we had like 15 kids that we took. So we just like poured missions into them, poured discipleship into them. Um, it was a sweet time marked with, with um, these real punctuated periods of sadness um, where she, she kept miscarrying. So we had, um, you know, a real desire to have kids. And then we had a miscarriage and then we had a ruptured tubal that was really traumatic and she almost died. And then we had, you know, miraculously she got pregnant again and um, she uh, carried the baby to about 10 weeks. And then we found out there was no heartbeat. And so just a, a lot of um, real darkness, even of faith, because there were, Aaron, there were periods in there where it felt like we had prayed and we had experienced the peace of Jesus. And so we thought that meant the baby was okay. And then for the baby to be dead was um, really wrecking, really wrecking of my faith. Um, but it's one of those things where, go ahead. What did it do to your faith? Well, especially that third one, um, when like she had spotted and so like I'd come home, she told me I'd come home and we had prayed and we're praying and praying that, that the baby would be OK. And we both got that same peace that I remember having back when I first got saved. And and we both felt filled with the peace of Christ. Um, and so when we went to the doctor the next day, you know, we're just expecting to see our baby. And instead, the, the lady on the ultrasound saying, you know, I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. And um, for me not only just the devastation of, of another loss and are we ever going to be able to have children, but I don't understand God. Um, like how, how could I have experienced peace and think that that means that the baby's okay and it's not. And if I don't understand God on that fundamental level, how in the world am I supposed to teach him to other people? Like how can I be standing with any credibility before these teenagers and, and telling them about God when I just, clearly don't seem to understand. Yeah. Um, and so with that, I think ultimately what I came to, because there's still a lot of mystery in it. Um, I think what I came to is that, that the peace of, of God is just simply the peace of God. Like that's the gift. It's not that I now know the future. Um, it's not that everything's going to work out exactly like I said, but like learning that the peace of Christ is the gift right. and that, and that's the gift is his presence and his presence is going to be there the next day when things go terrible as well. And so I don't have to, I don't have to live in the fear of the terrible because he will be there too. Right. And so, um, you know, I think all of these things were just kind of little primers and little lessons that, that God was slowly building and prepping for, for the next season of our life, which um, was the most devastating maybe that I'll ever have in my life. Um, we ended up having a little girl, um, 
named her Brooklyn Joy Holland. It was absolute miracle, July of 2002. Um, and then we had gotten involved with my church through to India with this organization called Hope Givers that I'm still involved with to this day that just does amazing work over there. They raise orphans, um, send them out as pastors across the villages of India. They've planted 60,000 churches. They had a Bible college, a hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife had a nursing degree. Christy had a nursing degree. And so um, after about five, six years at our church, and we began leading teams, adult teams from our church to India, um, we had made the decision that we were going to step down from my church and then go to India. And I would teach in the Bible college. She would help as a nurse and we would raise Brooklyn over there and be a part of the church. Um, right after I announced it, so it was like October of 2004, um, right around that same time, um, Christy started developing some, some pretty severe stomach problems. And, um, and it felt like every time we would take a step of faith forward towards the mission field, um, something would happen health wise. And so by December, we, we got the diagnosis that she had ulcerative colitis, which is an autoimmune disease that um, where your body attacks your own colon, like it's a parasite. And so your body tries to kill its own colon and it's excruciatingly painful. Um, but it's one that they know how to treat. And so, you know, a lot of people are just able to take drugs and stuff like that and um, medicines and, and go on with life. So we started having hospital stays in, in December of that year, um, Cleveland Clinic, which was like four hours away from home, we um, we then as as the treatment progressed, um, she kept having like failure to respond to treatment, allergic reactions to the drugs, you know, prednisone for months, which is a steroid, which starts affecting your personality, severe pain, um, and so. All of a sudden we found ourselves not just with with like a health crisis but a marital crisis as well because um if anybody's been in long-term chronic care of a sick person like it does it does a lot um not just to the physical health of the person but to the mental well-being of everybody involved and so um you know i felt like there were periods where it's like we're either going to the mission field or divorce and and I don't know how to make sense of that. And I want to die. Like, I don't want to kill myself, but God, I don't understand this. I just, I just want to die. Um, and, uh, you know, then we would get some reconciliation in our marriage and then something else would happen health wise. And so the, the 2005 was just this insane meat grinder where eventually India was off the table. Um, just a lot of hurtful experiences with believers who, in in trying to support just felt like they were adding gasoline onto the fire that was in my house um and then ultimately you know she opted to have surgery to just have her colon removed and be done with it in october of 2005 and so we're up in cleveland clinic uh prepping for surgery and she develops an infection um, in her bloodstream MRSA infection in her bloodstream which is antibiotic resistant so they can't do the surgery they cancel it. They put a, a, a pick line in her chest um, to be able to give her like four weeks of antibiotics, get her stable, send us home. This was, I think, October 10th, 2005. So we leave Cleveland Clinic that morning, drive four hours home. We're staying at her mom's house that night. And uh, just after I'd laid down in bed, her mom comes and wakes me up that she's collapsed in the bathroom. And so we go in there and she's disoriented and passes out. And as I run to get smelling salts to wake her up, she stops breathing. And so um, my wife went to heaven with me doing CPR on her on the floor of her mom's kitchen. You know, we, the ambulance came, they never, never brought her back. So from like 10 o'clock at night, one night, driving to the, am driving to the hospital, then pronouncing her dead. Um, eventually coming back home, just walking the streets of my neighborhood all night. And then, you know, being back in bed with my little now three and a half year old girl who slept through that whole thing. Um, and then, you know, you know, what's the worst thing that's ever happened in my life? Um, 
I don't even think it was actually her dying. I think it was holding my daughter in my arms who stumbles out awake in the morning asking, where's mommy? And telling her that, um, her, you know, mommy's with Jesus now. Um, which, yeah, like eternally, I can rejoice that mommy's with Jesus. But, but telling a little three-year-old that her mommy's dead and she's not going to see her in this life ever again was, I don't think it ever got worse than that. I, I mean, there were some really, really bad times following that but um how'd you take it um she cried she um you know she, she god puts a resiliency in little kids so like short term she cried those first few days felt like months um but i resigned from my job i was still at the same church i resigned from my job they were really generous gave me a love offering and i drained my savings and for about nine ten months we just lived um and recovered spent a lot of time together, started going to Nashville um, just to get out of town, um, ultimately decided to move there. Eventually, like on this freak trip, came down to Stewart, Florida um, to just like, I, I was in like South Alabama and I thought that was close to Disney World because I didn't have a phone that told me how far away it was. So come to Disney, visit a friend who we had known for some time and ended up um, by God's grace, can, my friend had married a girl from Stewart, Florida, and I ultimately ended up connecting with and 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 marrying her sister. Um, so when you ask how how did Brooklyn take it, she was, you know, sad, but but like theologically incredibly complex. Like God made this little three and a half, four year old girl, like profoundly theologically intelligent, and yeah. so. You know, he gave us to process together. He surrounded us with people. You know, there's still traumas with that that we're wrestling through now because, like, your your brain, you know, is making massive connections during that time. So experiencing a loss in the first five years of your life is is pretty huge. Yeah. So, um, like, I wouldn't say it's without effect at all, but, you know, my 16-year-old girl is one of the most amazing human beings that I've ever met. Yeah. And profoundly empathetic very intelligent and just a real joy so wow. yeah um, God, they, uh held you guys together i mean while learning like a new normal yeah you know, supported her in that little way yeah i assume supported you how, how did you what's the fallout spiritually? Um, so okay so spiritually there was never this like i want to abandon god thing like there was kind of anger and rage um sure. but um Directed there's a line you. there's a line of uh, a cayman's call song that's uh like where my shepherd leads where else can i go um, who else fills my cup till it overflows and and like so that and this rich mullins song hard to get um that was released after rich mullins died where the bridge of it is like i know you bore our sorrows i know you feel our pain and I know that it wouldn't hurt any less, even if it could be explained. And I know that I'm only lashing out at the one who loves me most. Um, mm. Like that stuff was really helpful for me to already have in my heart and head. Yeah. Um, that like Jesus understands grief and Jesus understands pain. And I think even like the, the marital strive, struggles that we had and the physical struggles that I watched her in complete agony for nine months soften the blow of death mm -hmm. because I could see how, like, yes, it's absolutely better for her to be with Jesus right now than to be suffering like she's suffering. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't know. It's like, you know, Aaron, there's so many things that we go through that, that are incredibly painful as we go through them and make no sense, but over the long haul, they, they just change your sense of perspective. They change the way that you're able to interpret everything else that happens. Um, for me, it was like, I could deep, deep hurt like Psalm 88, which is the only Psalm where there's no resolution to it. Like if you read Psalm 88, like it's just, it's like it ends with, and darkness is my only friend. Yeah. And like my soul felt that. Um, but the fact that God put a Psalm in the Bible, that's just a total complaint that doesn't end with, and I know that you'll work it all out. I know you'll make everything good. Like I understood that I had a God that, that could sit in my pain and in my anger and in my grief 
and I didn't have to play nice yeah. in there. And so that was very helpful for me. And he just, God put the people in my life that I needed to heal the Nashville community. Ended up moving there and being there a year and a half. And they were so helpful in, in recovering from grief. Um, so, um, awesome. well, you yeah, said, I, you said, wouldn't recommend it for anybody, but, uh, I mean, I know, I know Jesus in ways that, that I wouldn't, which then helped as, as life began to progress a little bit further along. Sure. You said you, um, came down to Stewart and, uh, yeah. ultimately married. um, I guess you had a son. Yeah, married a girl um, from Stewart. She lived in Nashville for a little bit. The housing market collapsed. I was a complete state snob, had no desire to ever live in Florida. I hate flat and I love seasons. And so, and by seasons, I don't mean like um, great and then wet hell, because that's yeah. what summer feels like in Florida. Yeah. Um, you know, I love the hills and seasons of, of Appalachia. But we had a house we couldn't sell. So we moved down here and it was God's sovereign grace. I ended up. Um, after a year, uh, got involved with the church right away. And then after a year, they hired me on. And for 10 years, I've been at Covenant Fellowship Baptist Church in Stewart. Um, Emily got pregnant. We had a son. She got pregnant again. We had another son. So we had Elijah and then Micah. Um, and then a little bit later, uh, we decided to get into fostering because not because of any sense of like, we don't have enough to do, but um, God had begun working in Emily's heart with um, a few different books that she had read. We were aware of like the human trafficking that goes on and how many people from the foster system end up in human trafficking. And I think there was a particular book, Renting Lacey, that she read and just couldn't get it out of her mind. And so um, my church is really heavy into foster and adoption. My senior pastor, Matt Price, they had adopted twins and there were a few other families that had got involved. And so we took a step of faith when, when our boys were still quite young, um, went through the training and became foster parents in, in Martin County. And so we had, I think, eight different children over the course of a couple of years, um, a long-term placement that we got to lead to Jesus and we're still in her life, even though she's back um, with her family. Um, and then we had, a, at one time, we had my four children, that one long-term placement, and then another little girl entered our life who... Um, by the time we got her at like 14 months, we were the fifth family. So wow. she had been removed in the hospital, detoxed. And then, you know, in that first year bounced from family to family to family. So, um, what's it, you know, what's it like foster, being a foster parent? Um, what, what's like, like if, if I'm, I'm married, right. And uh -huh. what would you tell me? Was it like, Okay. There's a movie that I'm, I cannot think of the name of right now, but Mark Wahlberg's in it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty recent and it's about foster and adoption. I, if the name pops up, I'll tell you somebody had to do it. Like it, it's so accurate because like you get into it, I think with these like altruistic motives, not, instant not to be like the hero, mm -hmm. but what's it called? Do you know? Instant family. Instant family. Yes. Yes, really good picture of, of a lot of what you experience in foster and adoption. But you don't get into it to be the hero. And if you do, that's a really, really bad idea. Sure. Um, but, you know, you get into it because you realize that God's giving you some, some capacity. You know you're going to be stretched, but, you know, you want to be the hands and feet of Jesus very tangibly to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. And then you find out what a horrible human being you are. Um, I I have never done anything in my life that remotely magnifies what a selfish, self-consumed, horrible human being that I am than being involved in the foster system, oh, be, having a foster kid. So um, come on and do it, everybody. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's great because, like, we want to be sanctified, right? So there's no greater fire than oh, having, man. like, every uh, – and, and, uh, you know, let me, let me say this too. Like there's some that don't do it because like I, you know, I have my basket of smart aleck things. I say there's people that don't do it. Cause they're like, Oh, I could never do that. Cause it would just break my heart to say goodbye to a kid. And I'm like, Oh, well, it's a good thing that I'm a robotic monster and don't have a heart sure. that way I'm able to do it, you yeah. know, cause it doesn't bother me at all to pour myself into a child and then have them ripped out. Um, but the truth is like, you know, something's going to be the hardest thing that you ever do in your life. Um, and a lot of people don't have any control over that. 
but but maybe you do you know maybe fostering and adopting is the hardest thing that you'll ever do in your life but why not make it the most worthwhile thing like if, if you have any choice in the hardest thing you're doing in your life why not be it something that you know is so close to the heart of jesus and sure. so I, th I think that's the case like this has transformed um, me and my family um my kids know that they're not the center of the universe because we they don't get to be none of us get to be but that also includes our little girl we ended up adopting out of it and so like that's kind of a it's hard to like separate these stories so i'll just kind of go in together so we get this little girl She's now the sixth child in our home. The fifth child, the other foster one, ended up disrupting like in a day. And disrupting means like they're in your home and then they get pulled out for some reason. And it was so traumatic, okay. so traumatic. It felt like a death. Like we thought we were going to adopt this little girl. Um, she's, yeah, um, you know, she lived in the room with my other daughter. They were sisters. And, and then all of a sudden it's ripped apart. So we, we processed through the grief of that we um, start to get a little better. And then this little girl that we have just starts exhibiting some really troubling behaviors. The, the little baby that we got at like 14 months old. So now she's mobile and like the Tasmanian devil um, and just destructive everywhere she goes. Like, oh, um, so she's, you know, in a daycare and like you can kind of see is that like you walk in the door, the teacher's like, take a deep breath and she's getting strep throat all the time and like no impulse control. Um, and it's like, okay, this is Jesus. All right, we can do this. This is like a full blown forest fire in our house right now, but we can do this. Um, but it's going to take everything we've got. And then all of a sudden, you know, a few months later, actually this is, we're in April right now. It was actually April 14th, 2014. So five years ago, almost to, to right now. Um, my son, Elijah, who was five at the time, my oldest son, he spikes like 101 fever over the weekend. By f Sunday, it climbed to 105. By Monday morning, he, um, like it was pretty clear he had pneumonia. So we go to the doctor and, and this is like a strong kid, healthy as a horse. He bicycled 15 miles with me the month before at this, um, as a five-year-old mm. at this uh, youth event that we went to. Um, and so we go in Monday morning, April 14th, and uh, to the ER because we couldn't get into our doctor. Still didn't feel like it's a big deal. Have a lot of kids. There's been plenty of sickness. Um, can we have some penicillin because our kid has pneumonia? And instead, I, I mean, I'll never forget that ER doctor coming into the room and just saying, this makes me sick to my stomach to say, but you, your son's really sick. And it looks like he has leukemia and there's an ambulance pulling up outside. Um to take you to St. Mary's, which is a children's hospital in, in West Palm beach. And, uh, I mean, like you talk about the floor dropping out, mm -hmm. the floor dropped out. Um, but even like then Aaron, when, when you feel like God, what in the world are you doing? Are you in this at all? God immediately began dripping little graces of, of his presence in our life. Um, in the ambulance, getting texts from, Pastor Bob, from Rod, from different people, and me being able to tell Elijah, hey, you know, Rod's praying for you, Bob's praying for you, and talking to the the, the EMT in the back um, about, you know, hey, the bomb's going to go off in your life, and do you have do you have the family of God in your life? Um, and then we get to the hospital, and um, this was this was crazy. Um, we had been on an insurance. I think we lost him. I think we lost him, folks. Here, let's see. Uh, see if we can get him back here. Man, that was that was crazy. I was, <laughs> oh man, if you're uh, joining us. Thank you for joining us, Bree. Jess and uh, the rest of you guys who's on here. Uh, let's see here. Yep, we definitely lost him for a second. I'm sure he'll be re be right back. He's definitely just reloading. 
All right, we're back. Okay, all right. So you were talking about uh, the insurance. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we were on this like cash pay group co-op. Um, Obamacare had had dissolved like our church's insurance policy. We were on this cash pay group co-op and it had taken four months to get our kids signed up for Florida Healthy Kids. So like January, February, March, April, or January, February, March, we were on like a cash pay Christian co-op with like a $250,000 max event thing. April 1st, we switch over insurances, but I also hadn't canceled my old insurance and I had an Aflac cancer policy. And I was going to, I was going to end them all at the end of April. And it was April 14th when Elijah was diagnosed. So like for the one 30 day period of my life, I was triple insured when my son was diagnosed with leukemia. And so here we are in this thing that absolutely wrecks and bankrupts families. And we were billed $2 million over the next couple of years and paid zero out of pocket for it. Wow. Um, like just absolute sovereignty of God in there. So um, Elijah was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We went through 10 months of intense treatment. There might've been 15 different chemos. We, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of chemo injections pills for three and a half years, steroids, you know, lose part of your hair. It comes back, lose more of your hair. Um, my wife and my son like didn't get to come to church for 10 and a half months um, because they were quarantined. And, um, but through this, like grace after grace of God, um, provision after provision of God, like somebody paid for um, a girl from our church to become the nanny um, to our family to take care of my little one who was now like so difficult that like she couldn't be in school. Sure. Um, so just like the, the, again, like the world is falling apart, but here's this very specific line of Jesus and, and um, never an audible voice, but, but so clearly that he's in this and he's involved even when things aren't going like I want them to go. Wow. Um, and so I think that's like, man, if I'm going to say, what are some of the like, big themes of my life. It's just like the sovereignty of God in the midst of, of calamity and crisis and like the visible fingerprints of God all around, even when I don't directly see his presence or understand what he's doing. Yeah. Um, like it's, you know, if I were an investigator that came upon a, you know, the scene after all of the events. It's like, this is just too coincidental. There's too many. Look at you right like, yeah. like, what? This is all God. Like God, yeah. it's all together. He yeah. gave me the peace. He put the people in place. It's, it's crazy, man. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. So, yeah. so by God's grace, my son now is, is healthy, strong, cancer free. Um, we are, we just celebrated five years since the first diagnosis in August of this year, we get to celebrate five years of no detectable signs of cancer. And that's really the end of the like super scary window. Man. I don't think, yeah, it's huge. I don't think you ever like get rid of the fear. Sure. Like it's, and, and, and Aaron, that's one of the things too, like we're allowed to legitimately be concerned and worried about stuff. When God says fear not, it's not like you just blindly don't, Ha live in reality because there's scary things. The reason God says fear not so much is because there's a lot of fearful things in our life. Fearful things out there. Um, and so I think sometimes it's, it's not even about being less afraid. It's about being more brave. Mm -hmm. So like the fear is not going to paralyze. I'm going to continue to walk forward and trust Jesus in spite of uh, what's going on. And for you is leaning into the sovereignty of God, that yeah. God has everything under control, that nothing yeah. is out of control for God. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, you've been a you've been you're a parent now of I'm a parent four or five four Six. kids actively yep um <laughs> so we've got it all together um yeah. <laughs> and actually on, on that line um so i'm also a, a youth pastor uh student pastor I'm, I'm do a bunch of other things at our church but my passion is is uh discipling students and parents and one of the things that i realized a number of years ago is like i just can't get all the parents together because I'm either with the kids or the parents have so many, you know, so much busy schedule that um, I can't get them together. But the most important thing is not for them to have a great youth pastor, but to have spiritually engaged moms and dads 
And so I started actually a podcast. Aaron, you know this because you're going to be on. Like we just did a couple uh, interviews. Lead you right into it, man. Yeah, man. Do you have um, like? Do you have any advice and where to find your podcast? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me give give me the one thing that you tell your parents, and then tell me tell us where to find some more of it. Okay. All right. The one thing that I tell my parents, and I end every po- podcast with this, is that parenting is a marathon, not a sprint. And if I were going to modify that at all, Aaron, hmm. I think I might change it to parenting is a tough mutter, not a marathon. Because a marathon, like you're just kind of running along. And as long as you got the endurance, you're there. But, uh, but yeah, like a tough mutter, like you're going to crawl through the mud. You're going to jump like through fire. Um, <laughs> you're going to like low crawl through electric shock therapy and like just your hips going to give out and somebody's going to have to drag you through. Sure. Um, th- the other thing is like I've, I got up to a half marathon before I, and like, then I just, you know, wimped out. There's, I'm never going to run a marathon, but, but I've run a couple of, of tough mutters and there's a community in tough mutters. And it's, it's wonderful because like you're getting destroyed, but you're able to laugh at yourself and, and laugh at one another. And like, if you don't have the community, Aaron, you're not getting over that wall. Cause it's like 14 feet high. And so, y'all are Vikings too. Like y'all yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, you know, parenting is a marathon, not a sprint, but truthfully, it's a tough mutter. Yeah. Um, but if I say that, I might have to like pay royalties to tough mutter. Um, so if somebody's interested, I do a weekly drive time podcast that's either an insight or an interview that, that um, helps parents in their, in their personal discipleship, in their marriage, and in their parenting. It's called Let's Parent on Purpose. You can find it at letsparentonpurpose.com. Um, it's also on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, anywhere people listen to podcasts. And I think we're, Aaron, you're going to be like right around episode 120 um, here. We're going to talk about the Avengers and finding the gospel in movies in a couple weeks. You you were just in. It's an awesome podcast. I'm excited to release it. Me too. Me too. Well, uh, Jay, is there, we're coming up on time here. Is there anything you want to leave us? I know you left us with a couple things, right? The mm-hmm. sovereignty of God in your life, the fingerprints of God and, and the evidence. If you were to just look at and yeah. I'm sure that if a lot of people were to look back on their lives with introspection and like self-reflection, all that stuff, they would see God's sovereign hands just taking care of them the whole time. And then, and then this thing about uh, parenting being a tough one, is there anything else you, you kind of, yeah, I, I think Aaron that um we are so quick to kind of look at a snapshot of our life or what's going on around and make all kinds of judgments. Um, and you can let, you know, I can show you any picture And you can come to the complete wrong conclusions about everything. Mm -hmm. Um, But so sometimes I think it's important to to like roll the videotape Mm -hmm. and not just of this minute, but like, okay, what has God done? What are the times when I completely didn't understand him, but then found him faithful? Mm -hmm. And how can I bring that into the present um, for whatever I'm experiencing now? Because this may be a completely unique and new experience for me. But there should be some building blocks of my relationship with Jesus, my experience and the way he works that help inform whatever this is. Sure. And so, you know, you, you know, there's always going to be trial, but there's always going to be grace for that trial. And I think like if we if we build upon the memory of how God's been there in the past, it will absolutely help us as we walk through the now. To these new trials with like a backpack full of lessons that you've learned and things that you know about God and about yourself. And then you absolutely. kind of walk into it with that. That's Look, right. It's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure, and a blast having you on the podcast. If you guys are with us still, we want to thank you for being here. Uh, we want to thank um, the the Fringe Network for hosting us on there. We want to thank the Patreon supporters on there too. We want to thank all the viewers and listeners if you're still streaming with us, um, and anyone in the group. Uh, be, if you found this like helpful, um, I'm going to put a lot of the notes in here. Like right, we got the. Uh, the movie, we've got different organizations that, and, and his church. I'm going to put them all in the notes uh, if you wanted to get to know, get to connect with Jay and his podcast and all that stuff, That all the resources that he has for you there. Um, and please share this uh, episode and share uh, the group with us so we could create this community of believers who reflect on God's work in their lives. Anyway, Jay, I want to finish off the podcast with this question. Uh, why do you think God is awesome? Why do I think God is awesome? Um, he didn't have to do any of this, right? Like, mm. 
I mean, I, I think about sometimes I go snorkeling and I'll see like this amazing reef and, and realize that God has been enjoying this since its very beginning. You know, you think of the cosmos and the, the, the splendor and amazing things and that God has been enjoying all of that. Like it was created for his pleasure. We were created for his pleasure. And one of the great pleasures of jo God is to to share the things that he delights in with us. And he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do any of that. He didn't have to put up with us, um, but he's gracious. He's sovereign. Yeah. And um, and he is about our deep joy as we find our pleasure in him. So um, it's a great journey. That's awesome. That's amazing. Well, Jay, I want to thank you guys. Thank you one more time. We love you all. Thanks for listening. And we will see you guys on the next episode of the God is Awesome podcast. All right.